Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unstructured Unlocked. I'm your host, Chris Wells, VP of R&D at Indico Data, and I'm really happy to introduce you to my guest today, Patricia Thane, CEO of Private AI. Patricia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, you're a little bit off the beaten path in terms of the guests we've had so far on the show, which I'm excited about. There's a lot of good stuff to discuss. Um, why don't we start with you telling us about your journey through the tech world and what it is exactly that goes on at Private AI. Uh, journey through the tech world. How far back do you want me to go? <laughs> go, go as far back as you think is interesting. All right. Uh, I actually started out in English literature uh, and then moved to linguistics uh, because I got kind of annoyed at the process of uh, teaching English literature. Uh. Uh, and then um I thought, well, eventually I'm going to want to have a job and linguistics gives no job prospects. What am I going to combine this with? Uh, and I found out that there's this thing called computational linguistics. Uh, so sure I started is. looking into that, did uh, a programming class, absolutely loved uh, computer science, ended up making that my major, and uh, then started a master's in computational linguistics at the University of Toronto um, right after undergrad. Uh, following that, uh, during my master's, I knew I wanted to start a company, and the decision was, do I start a PhD and work on a company during a PhD, or uh, do I um, join a startup to learn the ropes? And I chose the former. Yeah. So for private AI, uh, it's really about making it super simple for developers to integrate privacy into their pipelines because they're not experts with, of privacy. A lot of people need to uh, worry about either compliance or customer trust, and yep. they're collecting unstructured data that often they need to be able to see in order to debug their systems, train their models. Uh, so if imagine you're a Grammarly uh, and you want to integrate a privacy layer into Grammarly. Uh, if we didn't exist, you'd either have to rely on a third party that actually has very low accuracy that you're sending your data to, uh, and therefore not not respecting your own customer's privacy because some of them store your data and use it to train their models, okay. uh, where you'd have to build in-house. And we found a lot of people were building in-house. Yeah, uh, I can say, I can validate both of those things. I have built privacy pipelines myself in-house, mm -hmm. and I've also used private AI, and um, I far prefer private AI. Much appreciated. <laughs> I'm of so course. glad that you're less painful than building it yourself. <laughs> yeah, much less painful. Download API key, get mm. privacy. It's pretty great. Indeed. Thank you. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm always happy to be a commercial for you all. It's good stuff. <laughs> um, I, uh, I also want to say, I think you just set a record for the earliest mention of unstructured data on the podcast. So well done. It's exciting. Thank you. We have a, Thank you. have a lot to talk about there. Um, yeah, it's the best kind of data. It's the worst to work with, but the most exciting stuff is inside of it. Um, I was uh, I was perusing your LinkedIn. Could you give us the two minute introduction to what homomorphic encryption is? I want to know what those words I, mean together. Absolutely. So homomorphic encryption uh, is a technology that I worked a lot of my PhD on. Um, by the way, I'm an in denial dropout. I'm on leave, but probably never going back. Um, and the... Uh, the technology there, it's all about being able to compute on encrypted data. So you encrypt a one, you encrypt a two, uh, you add them together, multiply them together, you get a, a three or a two, uh, if you yeah. want. <laughs> uh, and it's really good for, for example, matrix multiplications um, and polynomial operations, but not good for non-polynomial operations. Uh, okay. So it can be used for password management, for example. Uh, and uh, it is being used by Microsoft for password management. Uh, it can be used for searching encrypted databases. So you are a client uh, sending an encrypted query to a cloud, uh, and that cloud has no idea what you're searching for, and then you get it back, and it, you unencrypted, no one's any the wiser. Uh, and a lot of homomorphic encryption schemes are quantum safe, uh, which means not oh, that interesting. not that there's a proof um, that a quantum computers can't break it, but that they haven't broken it yet. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a lot of them are based on what's called lattice-based cryptography. Uh, and I can nerd out as much as you want or as little as you want. <laughs> That's great. So yeah. like this kind of encryption is uh, immune to Shor's algorithm. Is that the kind of thing we're talking about? 
Correct. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's one of the algorithms it's immune to. Uh, that's cool. And it's, yeah, so it's it's partially what financial institutions might rely on if we if yeah. uh, quantum computers ever become ubiquitous and people could just okay. read our essay on the uh, flip of a dime. Uh, and a lot of uh, privacy preserving machine learning teams, not that there are many out there in the first place, but several oh. of the ones that are out there uh, will uh, are, have been looking into combining homomorphic encryption with machine learning. Uh, the trickiest part is generally the non-polynomial aspect of it. So the ReLU yep. functions, sigmoid functions, and yep. I could dive into how they deal with it, but. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So you, you're like, a, you know, Privacy, privacy is like a genetic thing for you, like top uh, to bottom. At this point, at this point, it's been a, quite a while that I've been working on privacy on yeah. a variety of technologies. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it's always nice to meet another recovering academic. I, uh, <laughs> I, I hung up my red grading pen many years ago and haven't looked back. It has. Um, it does have its perks. It does. Um, so good. So that's private AI. That's what you do. And again, big shout out to the tech. It works really well. Um, as, as you're, you know, you know, you're the CEO and, you know, you're an early stage company, so you're out there selling, I imagine what Indeed. sort of, what sort of verticals are really embracing this technology? Hmm. Uh, great question. So we are seeing a lot of traction in conversational AI, uh, a okay. lot of traction from AI companies as well, customer service, insurance, um, telemedicine, insure tech. Uh, financial institutions, basically very vertical agnostic. There are some that are just not ready for it yet. Um, okay. Which ones would that be? Well, let me, let's, let's pause there. I want to dig yeah. in and maybe a concrete example. Like how does, you know, how does your engine show up in a conversational AI setting, say in the, mm -hmm. you know, say in the telemedicine uh, space? Yeah. So suppose you want uh, to keep HIPAA compliant uh, records of calls and you want to share these with uh, third parties so that you can make your processing more accurate uh, yep. or uh, provide extra feedback or um, analysis of a call. Uh, you want to limit the amount of PII that's being uh, sent over. Uh, you actually want to probably follow HIPAA compliance uh, safe harbor guidelines, which lists okay. 18 different entity types. Uh, that you need to remove. Uh, so you, in that case, you want to keep the protected health information, like what disease they had, what symptoms they had, but you want to remove things like their healthcare number and their name and uh, their location, unless it's state level. Uh, and where we come in is to automatically scrub it. Uh, and it's very difficult to do because of how messy uh, conversations are. So somebody might say, yeah, my my healthcare number is a uh, five three. No, sorry, actually that was a five two. And then yeah. you need to, to capture all of that. Uh, and traditionally, that's done with regular expressions, which do not generalize well for unstructured data. Right, right. absolutely. So you're working at the level of like the chatbot on my phone. Or are you also working with like phone transcripts and data like that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, that's exciting and. How many how many entities are you able to obscure slash spoof? Uh, over fifty different entity types. Wow. Okay. Across forty two uh, languages. That's awesome. What's uh, which one are you most proud of? Like, which one's the hardest to figure out? Uh, which one? The numerical PI is such a nightmare. Okay. All right. Um, especially can... because there's you know you're not going to find data sets out there with credit card numbers and people talking about their credit card numbers. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not unless you're, you know, you're on 4chan, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, and also uh, the ability to capture these different types of PII across multiple languages as somebody quotes, which is within a conversation. So some countries might have uh, Franglais in Canada or Spanglish in, uh, yeah. in the U.S. or Hinglish in India. Yeah. Generally pidgin, right? You know, mixtures yeah. of languages. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so being able to do that, I'm also very proud of the team to, for having developed. Fascinating. All right, I could dig into this a lot. Maybe one, maybe one more question on the tech. You mm -hmm. mentioned data sets being hard to find. So how, you know, how do you go about improving your models? Mm -hmm. And you're not, and you're not using client data, which is huge. I love that. 
Yeah, unless they specifically give us access to de-identified data. Yep. And so it has to be specifically <clears throat> that information. Uh, a lot of data is synthetic. Um, a okay. lot of it we source ourselves online um, as long as the uh, license allows us to use yeah. it commercially. Uh, I have, I mean, that is not so obvious. I have seen nope. um, certain companies list the data sets that they use to train their models. And if you look at the licenses of those data sets, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Medical data sets uh, that are specifically for research purposes only, and you can't even buy a license for. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Da data data licensing is a real problem. We could do a whole podcast just on that, <laughs> I think. Yeah, seriously. And it's not something they teach you in school. No. No, they don't. Like many other useful things not taught mm -hmm. in schools. Uh, good. Okay. So that's a little bit about the tech and some of the verticals. Um, when you're selling to these companies that are out there and they're saying, I need a privacy solution, what are the personalities, roles that you're that you're talking to? Like who's out there shopping right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, our goal is to sell to developers. So ultimately that's who we are okay. selling to, but we might normally talk to their managers uh, who are more aware of the um, uh, the actual problem that they're trying to solve uh, because they know where the data is coming from uh, who the data has to go to uh, and who's getting angry at the top for misusing the data. Yeah. Okay. So how, how does that work? If the developer, you know, you've got an API out there in the cloud, are they sending the data to your cloud or how are they, how are they actually getting this technology into their pipelines? Mm, um, rarely uh, that way. Um, most of the time, because we practice what we preach and we want to yeah. minimize the flow of personal information. Uh, we send, a container to their environment that they deploy there, uh, and then they call it as a Rust API. Oh, interesting. So then they just have to pass some security scans with the container, and and they're good yeah. to go. Yeah. And this is yeah. like in individual developer buying a license or a couple of licenses for the for the tech stack they're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, and cool. uh, we always get some uh, pleasantly surprised people when they run the the uh, security scan on the container yeah. and say, "Oh, normally we find thirty different vulnerabilities." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yours are clean. Yeah, that's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, love to hear it. Um, okay, so you're you're targeting the individual developer. Are they mostly working on? You know, you talked about chatbots. Um, what types of projects are they working on that they're injecting? They're trying to inject privacy in. Ah, um, okay. So chatbots, for example, uh, yeah. have a really big problem that if you want to use production data to train your models. Uh, those models are going to be memorizing information from that production data. That's right. Yep. One solution proposed is differentially private training. However, very costly, uh, very noisy, yep. um, and you need to make assumptions of independence that don't always hold. Yep. Another option is uh, to do what we allow people to do, which is replace uh, personal information with fake personal information. So if it's not there in the first place, it's not going to memorize it. And in addition to that, uh, if you've got the replacement in place that's very natural, you're not going to suffer downstream model accuracy loss. And you can still tell what a conversation was about. Uh, you can still tell whether they were happy or not. You can use it for training. Uh, you can use it for um, information even about you know which location an accident happened in without necessarily have, being able to tie that into a policy number or a, a, a person's name. So oh, interesting. There's so much uh, rich data around the PII that's just toxic. Yeah. And because we can just replace it naturally, you can go ahead and use the data as if it were the original one. Interesting. So that they, so you find that your clients, your users are, in a lot of cases, using this as part of the ETL pipeline to scrub the data before it gets sent to a machine learning model. And, exactly. And because of the way it's working, the... Uh, the sort of correlations among entities within within the uh, text are being preserved. Is that how? Is that the right way to think of it? Um, it can, if if chosen yeah. to, to a certain extent. Um, but oftentimes it's not really the entities that people are interested in. It's more okay. the flow, the local context. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Interesting. Very mm -hmm. cool stuff. Thank you. Um, so I've spent uh too much of my time in my life, probably selling, trying to sell AI to the enterprise, both in my previous career as, uh, you know, picking vendors to build a data science stack. And then now at Indico, 
um, trying to sell AI to the enterprise. What do you find to be um, the big challenges in getting big companies to embrace AI? Mm, the big challenges to getting... So I don't see it so much as uh, the company, big companies having to embrace AI as there's a solution to a problem and maybe AI solves it better. And it's okay. less than you're selling to them, not AI itself. Yeah. Unpack that a little bit further. That's an yeah. interesting thought. Let me give you an example. Um, yeah. Data loss prevention companies uh, yep. can do a lot of regular expression scans that are very efficient. And so you can process a huge amount of flow of data through them. Uh, and if it's not perfect, it's fine because it could still pick up uh, more or less a, whether there's some sort of sensitive or personal information yeah. within there shouldn't be going. Um, however, when you need something to be very very precise, like what you're sending to a machine learning team, uh, yeah. like what you're sending to um, a third party, uh, or if you need to create a report that's very specific because there was a data leak, for example. Okay. Uh, that is something DLP providers are not uh, able to do. But if you go to an enterprise and you say, I can solve this problem with a more precise solution than DLP solutions do, yeah. they don't care if you're using regular expressions that are better or if you're using AI that are better, as long as it works. As long so as it's, it's really the AI yeah. that you're selling. Yeah, interesting. That's a good distinction. So um, I wanted to dig in a little bit to some of these regulations. Yeah, hold on one second. Sorry. Hey, how you doing, pal? Um, one of the sources of frustration for me as I was, as I was looking at data privacy back in the day, I don't do so much with it nowadays, but was that the regulations are extremely stark. They're like, mm -hmm. no PII rather, whereas like a data scientist like myself would say, mm -hmm. okay, I can guarantee it 99% confidence that we've scrubbed this much of the PII. Right. So mm -hmm. how, how are people thinking through that right now? Mm -hmm. Cause I, I, that's, I think that's been a common pain point in the last few years. That is a great question. Um, so HIPAA, for example, is yeah. the only one that provides a re-identification risk threshold of 0.4%. Yep. And it's, it's a pretty high threshold, um, but... 0.04, so four out of 10,000 instances can get through. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that is one guideline. Uh, and what I like about that guideline, even though it's it is cer uh, certainly flawed, is that it is admitting that no one's perfect. And yeah. what we can and the thing is, uh, a lot of people expect privacy technologies to be perfect. Otherwise, why would we even use them? Um, all right, well, let's just not encrypt things because people can go <laughs> get phishing attacked. Um, let's yeah. just forget about VPNs. Who cares? Because they can't be perfect. Uh, not not how it works. Uh, our goal is to minimize risk. And um, I can't speak for all legislators, but it seems like uh, as long as you've made a genuinely good attempt at finding the best solutions, at uh, thinking through the vulnerabilities and addressing them, you if or when a data leak or a vulnerability gets exposed happens, uh, yeah. the public and also, the the legislators will be a lot more lenient on you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Minimizing risk. I one of the conversations I had back in the day was, um, well, you can't put this in the cloud because you know the cloud's dangerous. And I pointed out that these documents had been copied dozens of times across network drives and people's laptops. It's like you know, th this is probably the least of your worries. The fact that this is within our own VPC in and AWS. <laughs> So, so that point about like making a reasonable attempt, I think is, um, it sounds like people are thinking the right thoughts nowadays, which is exciting to me. Yeah. And I'm curious about uh, what you have found to be the biggest uh, problem with selling AI to enterprise. So it's actually, it's actually related to the question that I asked you about, you know, how do you, how do you prove that it's good enough or do you have a good measure of good enough? And I, I find that a lot of folks will approach our technology, for example, helps folks automate um, their unstructured data flows. So moving documents through a pipeline, whatever that human driven pipeline is, starting with email and ending in a database kind of a thing. Um, and we always get asked, or most of the time we get asked the question, like, what's the accuracy going to be? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, 
my standard answer is that accuracy doesn't convert. It doesn't have units. So you can't like convert it to time saved and which converts to dollars saved. And so I liked your answer about, you know, it's, it's really about minimizing risk. And our technology is really about optimizing a process um, by taking unstructured and adding structure to it. And so mm-hmm. getting people to stop thinking the thoughts that maybe make a lot of sense for a robotic process where it's, yeah. you know, rules driven. Um, has been a challenge and I we're starting to see some daylight there but a lot of people are still stuck in that that old way of thinking about things that's a really good point um and I'd, I'd like to add to that uh, please when it comes to accuracy we're getting to the point where AI systems in certain cases if you're creating on the right data will perform these tasks more accurately than humans 100 percent yep and I think there's this expectation that humans are perfect. There is not perfect. <laughs> no. Um, in if somebody's not willing to accept that, I don't think that they're really going to understand what the accuracy truly means. No, I I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where I've said, "Hey, just as a ba- as a baseline, how accurate is your human process today?" And the answer is, "Well, it's one hundred percent." No, it's not. That means you haven't measured it. <laughs> um, and and then the corollary is, you know, you get into a platform you you start trying to build out an AI solution and you have four or five people supervising the machines and it turns out they're actually teaching the machines four or five different processes, right? And yeah. there's this latent variable, which is, is it Bob or Sue or, you know, Jane who didn't have her second cup of coffee this morning doing the job and the, the model doesn't have access to that, that latent information, right? So um, there are very few, some of those, the, the thing about some of those tasks where AI is starting to beat humans, you know, like I think about chess engines nowadays, way better than, than human players. Go, um, image identification. Uh, those are real neat and tidy tasks. And the stuff mm-hmm. that people do, knowledge workers do in their jobs, not neat and tidy. And so that, that, that really is the starting point. Like what should we automate? What should we structure? And then and let's figure out how to do it with AI. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of these tasks are just simply not scalable when it's a human doing them. Indeed. Yeah. And so not scalable and, and again, not uniform. So good. So that's selling AI to the enterprise. Um, any, uh, I don't know how easy any of this is to share, but like anonymized wins or client successes that you're really proud of, you'd like to sort of share with the audience? Ooh, uh, I mean, there are quite a few. Um, yeah, go for it. I can I can share them anonymously as you <laughs> mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we do have a few public companies as, as customers, um, which is always very exciting for a semi early startup. I mean, we're only two three years old, three years I guess at this point. Um, one of them is uh, one of the biggest uh, communications uh, systems creator. I guess you could qualify okay. them as. Uh, we have uh, insurance uh, that uh, purchases our system. Uh, we have had financial institutions um, who use our systems on a uh, yeah. one-off basis, but also some that uh, do ARR. Um, so being able to go across all of these verticals is really exciting to me because my yeah. uh, our vision for the company is really have for everybody to be able to just plug and play privacy. And yeah. uh, the fact that the models that we've trained are so flexible across all these in- different industries is uh, yeah, really exciting. Yeah, that is really exciting. Um, generalized, generalizability with AI is, is obviously a hot topic um, mm-hmm. in the research, uh, the research community. Uh, talk to me about a use case that really surprised you. Like you used it for what? <laughs> Oh, uh, we have some customers that use this for named entity recognition because we have such an accurate system because we have to be so accurate yeah. uh, that we're the most accurate NER system they've found on the market. Wow. <laughs> okay. So they, they've tried Azure, Google, Textract, all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, they Amazon tried everything. Cognitive. Yeah. Yeah. Which is hilarious. Um, is hilarious. An unexpected uh, side, side benefit. Uh, other cases I have, I think that was the most surprising. Okay. Just yeah. vanilla NER, but vanilla really, really NER. good. Yeah. 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 That's cool. 
I love it. Um, so let's uh, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, you teased unstructured data at the top, and of course, that is the topic of the day. How do you, Patricia Thane, define unstructured data? Mm, uh, data that is very messy, okay, or you know that you need to structure in some way yeah. to get some sort of value out of. Um, I guess you don't necessarily need to. That is quite the question uh, there, Chris. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> uh yeah data that's not in a table yeah that's my favorite definition is something you can't fit in an excel sheet or a database yeah. at least not in a meaningful way like you could put pictures of cats and dogs and cells in excel but uh mm -hmm. you're not going to run any formulas on them yeah exactly and uh just on that line um, yeah I'm sort of on that line i mean there's so much to say about unstructured data this is a random thought that came to mind yeah. uh there's this belief that uh, companies get more value from structured data than unstructured data. Sure. Uh, and well, they put in the time to structure it. So that makes yeah. sense. Uh, but now we're at the stage where machine learning is actually allowing us to do the same for unstructured data uh, because of its unprecedented accuracy and scale. Yeah. Uh, so that is going to flip around very soon. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I One of the... One of the earliest um, aha moments for me in working with unstructured data was we were trying to do a structured data machine learning project. And we were like, this data is just such a mess and realized that it was all transaction data. And we could go back to the source contracts using NLP and actually rebuild the database as ground oh. truth because the documents are actually the ground truth, right? Someone hand keyed yeah. these things and did a terrible job. And uh, of machines working better than humans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because the humans, you know, if you don't set up your database right with the right validation, I can put a string in instead of uh, 10%, right? I can write it out. And uh, that's a dumb example. But I think we're, we're going to see, we're going to see in the future where there's going to be a real opportunity for your data lake of unstructured data to actually be the ground truth instead of some distilled version um, that's in a database that you're not you know, taking as good a care of as you should. Absolutely. Um, um, where do you, you work with a lot of companies that are working with their unstructured data? Where do you think we are in terms of, um, where do you think the enterprise is? Let me phrase it that way. Where do you think the enterprise is on the maturity curve of working with unstructured data? You said it's going to flip soon, but like how soon is soon? Oh yeah. Soon on an enterprise scale, not, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how, I think it really depends. Some banks, for example, are yeah. light years away from other banks. Okay. Uh, some insurance companies are light years away from other insurance companies. Agreed. Uh, and you can see that the ones who've started more recently and who have taken what AI can do for them uh, from, from the very beginning ha are getting that competitive advantage uh, that the behemoths that are slower to move might be concerned about. Yeah. So I think there you you identified two of the markers that sort of distinguish uh, maturity as being started recently um, and size, or I would I might rephrase it as inertia. There um, there are a few that are very large that are also innovative. Um, okay. So garbage. why? Okay, why are why are they innovative? What's the characteristic of them that's that's letting them win? I think a mandate from the top. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and I think good management. Good management. Yeah, we um on the podcast here we talk with a lot of centers of excellence uh, leaders for automation and. Two of the characteristics that I often see in mature organizations is one, just alignment top to bottom on the value and what we're trying to accomplish. And mm -hmm. two, the people that are actually leading that COE, uh, and this describes all of the guests that I've had on the show, actually know what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And they have good processes and um, good accountability and all of that. So and governance is a huge one, right? Right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So that lines up. Uh, any, other, any other markers that you would say you see as being like a sign that an organization like a big organization is is ready to go with AI. Mm. 
they've started thinking about data rather than just about hiring machine learning engineers. Yeah, talk to me about that one. Yeah. Yeah. So the quality of the data is everything, right? When you're going to train the models. Um, and in some cases, uh, some people will hire machine learning engineers and have them label the data uh, and do all of the other work. Nope, uh, don't do it. It's just incredibly inefficient. Yeah. Um, and I think that in part, that's about hiring proper project management uh, with some yes. experience in AI deployment. Um, and I think that as more and more people get that experience in AI deployment and then move to these larger institutions um, or move across institutions to share that knowledge, yep. uh, we'll probably see more uptake of actual AI solutions that get deployed. Yeah, that that's a really good one. I want to I want to turn that one into a soundbite. Don't hire machine learning engineers until you've figured out your data and how you really yeah. want to use it. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's great advice. And if you're out there and you're listening to this and you have machine learning engineers that are that are labeling data on mass, like but fire yourself. You've done a bad job. Um, Seriously, that's, that's <laughs> sorry, not sorry what they're to for. Whoever's listening to that, but yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe not fire yourself. Learn, yeah, improve. move on. Okay. That's the much more diplomatic way to put it. Yeah, but please do learn the lesson. Like there are people. The difference between structured and unstructured data is that. It takes intelligence to decide what the right structure is and two different mm -hmm. intelligence looking at the same document. You know, even something as subtle as I'm an account receivable versus accounts payable, I'm going to be more focused on different parts of that invoice as I work yeah. with it, right? So um, you have to bring that intelligence to those documents and images and whatever else it might be. And uh, your machine le learning engineers have intelligence, but it's not exactly. that. Exactly. And yeah. this is actually something that I think healthcare uh, AI has figured out because the data is just so foreign to the machine learning engineers and it's so ah. obviously foreign. Uh, so who do they get to label it? Doctors, nurses, yeah. people who have some sort of grown in healthcare or biology. Uh, That's they don't... interesting. Yeah. Okay. I am. Um, I generally don't think of healthcare as being the cutting edge of anything. Of course, I live in the United States, so, you know, it's a whole other ball of wax. That's interesting. But, you know, a lot of Canadian uh, startups that do work in healthcare actually sell to U.S. hospitals before they sell to Canadian hospitals. Because you guys have more money. So you are at the cutting edge of innovation when it comes this to This is good. Tech. This is good. I'm learning things here. I love it. Um, so that's where we are on the maturity curve. Uh, obviously, depends on a few factors, which we talked about. Size of the organization, how recently they've started, um, you know, whether they have... I would characterize it as whether they have someone in a in a management role or a, a business project uh, management role that has had a win uh, deploying AI successfully. Um, so the answer to how mature the enterprise is, is it depends on those things. Um, it does. And it might change from team to team. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially in some of these large orgs where you're just totally siloed, right? And you'll have your own, your own IT stack and business stack on top mm -hmm. of one another. Yeah. Uh, what can, thinking about this, um, and I, I like the point you raised about um, Canadian healthcare tech startups. What can AI vendors do to help the enterprise get up that maturity curve faster? Is there anything that we could all be doing together? Um, I think it really depends on the use case. Okay. Yeah. Focus on a use case that's familiar to you. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Let's see. So I think at one point, um, it's all about whether you're addressing a current pain point, and in some cases, a current yeah. pain point that they tried to address themselves uh, yeah. for about a year or two and then failed. Uh, that's really when you want to come in. Yeah. And there's, I'm I'm actually a big believer that people don't change very easily, um, and yes, <laughs> uh, it takes personal experience for a lot of people to recognize uh, what the right path is. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's actually just about waiting it out. Interesting. So this is this is this is a bit contrarian. I like this. Uh, so you're saying the enterprise is eventually going to figure it out. They have to see enough wins, and you'll get sort of a snowball effect. But enough wins the, and enough lose losses as well. Yeah. Um, not to do to be able to look at a vendor and say, oh, these guys. They're not bullshitting me. They know what they're doing. They're going to get be able to deploy. Correctly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Interesting. I like that. Uh, and I, I'll, you know, I can, I can attest that people don't like to change. I've had the same haircut for eight years now. And I, <laughs> I would, I would do something different. I just can't think of anything to do differently <laughs> with my hair. Funny. Uh, that is too funny. I found out how to cut my own hair in uh, five minutes during the pandemic. Like, uh, yeah, like most of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. oh, man, what a world. Um, okay. So for AI vendors, uh, wait it out. Is there anything that AI vendors can do? So Indico's had the same experience where we've had, we've had large, super big enterprise companies come to us and say, oh, we'll try it, but we've mm -hmm. tried two dozen other vendors and then we win the contract. And so there, I can, you know, sort of anecdotally say there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Is there anything that AI vendors can do to help um, the enterprise understand better some of those losses and why when when they do when they do get a win by using your tech, whoever you are, Mr. Vendor or Mrs. Vendor, mm -hmm. um, why that was a win for them? Is there mm -hmm. is there any part of the sales process yeah. that could be better there? Yeah, I mean, there it it is sometimes tough to determine ROI, um, but giving your best estimate uh, and saying how many annotation hours or years went into it, how many engineer hours went into it. Um, give an example of other organizations with AI teams who chose to use your solution because they didn't want to build it themselves. Uh, those things tend to work, uh, but usually with the people who are already trying to find the problem or, or already found the problem or trying to find a solution to the problem that they found and yeah. maybe trying to solve. Um, I think with regards to the ones that aren't there yet, just sound bites of education and yeah. eventually eventually there will be some conversion. Yeah, a, sort of a, a nurture type of sales motion, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's great. Uh, you talked about ROI, and I, I want to zoom in on that. But first, I want to ask, like, early on in my days building a data science team, I was I was more interested in buying platforms to solve problems that were already sort of solved rather than yeah, we could we could download download Roberta and you know build our own training harness for it and and ingest labeled data. But why don't we buy a platform that already does that? They exist. Yeah. Do you find yourself when people are evaluating your product? Do you find yourself in a situation where the data scientists are like, "Nah, we can get there. We'll build our own privacy engine. We don't we don't need to buy an external." Process. On occasion. On occasion. Uh, and. So far, I think every single time they've come back about a year later to, for us. A year, okay. And what had changed? Pretty consistently. They, they just, they just failed? Later. Um, they either realized that they didn't have time to prioritize it. Yeah. Uh, realized that uh, it is a lot harder than they thought it was yeah. uh, going to be. Um, and at some point, I think once they start looking into it, it can get overwhelming uh, because they need to do it for multiple languages they need to do it for yeah. uh multiple legislations they don't really have a grasp uh, on privacy law they might not have access to a privacy lawyer to give them advice um it's it's just and that's just part of it right the actual model deployment uh the actual making sure the model isn't in, has no bugs in production uh that's a really painful yeah. part and do you have the team once that model is built to make sure that that model is going to be reliable. Yeah, there was a bit. There was a big trend about five years ago where everyone was talking about you need to hire full stack data scientists. And while there are some, there are definitely parts of the stack they'd rather be working in than others. And often, the the the, the model ops part of it is not the place where they want to spend their time. Right. Right, and there are some people who love model ops. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and they they didn't become data scientists. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are. They're an even rarer form of DevOps personality, right? And mm. super critical. Yeah. Um, so let's see. We're uh, doing great on time here. What can you talked a little bit about? We talked a little bit about what the AI vendors can do for the folks out there in the enterprise, you know, listening to this podcast because they want to learn more about unstructured data. Where should they be going to get better educated? Is it just, you know, call up Chris and Patricia on LinkedIn or are there resources that you recommend to folks or is it just you have to try it out, you have to live it? So learning more about unstructured data or what AI can do for unstructured data? Uh, the latter. Okay. Um, 
I I think most of the courses that you can find out there are either on Coursera or I think um Microsoft has some good ones too. Um uh Udemy and so on. Uh just get learn a basic AI, uh, about the basics of AI. Uh learn about what the data has to look like uh, to, for at least a couple of projects so that you could get some idea of uh, what those patterns are that the machine is learning. Yep. Um, and, you know, try to think of a task and then get a few samples of data and try to label it yourself and see, see what you learn. Yeah. Okay. That's good advice. Get your hands dirty, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Figure, that helps you uh, think of the nuances of where, uh, there might be corner cases an AI model isn't going to pick up uh, right off the bat. Yeah. So let's, this is actually one of my favorite topics when it comes to uh, AI and unstructured data is how, how do you turn the black box gray? Like how do you, how do you help people understand why the AI made a mistake or why it made the right choice when it made the right choice? Yeah, it, it depends on the task there too. Um, but if we okay. think about AI detection, um, that it made the right choice. I think normally if somebody thinks that it didn't make the right choice uh, and it actually did, uh, we, we send them the definition that we're using for that particular entity. Yep. Um, if it didn't, um, it's normally because we haven't seen any similar context before. So okay. uh, what we do there is not try to explain why it didn't work to them. We just fix it and send them a... Okay. A yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And um, on, on a related note, how do you... Um, when you said you do some of these like custom builds with a customer's data, mm -hmm. how do you how do you help them and guide them towards, you know, choosing the right data to build the right model? Ah, um, we only need a few samples of their data. Uh, and okay. it tends to be for a very specific use case. So we don't really tell them uh, too much about what data to give us as long as there's, we just ask for some variety of the kind of data that they'll be processing. Okay. Awesome. Really lightweight. I love it. Yeah, it's super lightweight. All right, so with the last five or 10 minutes, let's put on our like, you know, uh, uh, put on our magician's hat or look into the crystal ball or whatever you want to call it. What are you most excited about in the, the next couple of years in terms of where AI is going? Ooh, um, interesting question. I'm excited that, uh, it's less hype and much more real world deployments now. The yeah. tools are out there to make it possible for real world deployments in a way that weren't av wasn't available in 2016, say. Uh, the models are much better. Uh, the yeah. understanding uh, and expertise is growing. Uh, and uh, previously machine learning engineers were really hard to come by. Now universities are producing a lot of them. They yeah, We're going to be able to see a lot more um, app, real world deployments as a result of that as well. Uh, so what I'm most excited about is uh, less talk, more action. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, I, I am also very excited about that. I have survived the hype cycle and everyone carries some wounds, I think. Um, what do you what do you think are. How should I phrase this? What do you think the scariest things are about AI becoming more ubiquitous, especially in the, you know, in the enterprise context in the next few years? Mm. I, I would tie that into, I mean, of course, the misuses, the possible misuses. Um, yep. For example, our, the technology that we're building uh, from what we build now to what we're planning on building, um, it can, on, on a dime, turn into surveillance tech. Interesting. And what concerns me most is, uh, you know, I'm building a privacy product uh, and we're building a privacy company together. Um, but what if uh, one day I accidentally onboard an investor uh, who tells us, oh, look at that $100 million uh, contract with the NSA. Yeah. 
or with another surveillance uh, organization for surveillance specifically. So yep. here's the thing. Um, I I don't I don't disagree that a certain amount of surveillance is probably necessary, right? Uh, yep. For for um, national security. However, not everybody needs to be surveilled, and as we know, a lot of uh, surveillance agencies do overextend. Yeah. Um, what has been proposed, for example, by Anne Kavukian uh, when she was Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, is privacy-preserving surveillance. And that is something that our tech could help with by removing the personally identifiable information, unless somebody says uh, in a conversation, I'm going to attack X location. Yeah. Right? Then you might want to figure out whose name that was and where they're located. Yeah, so conditional surveillance. Conditional surveillance. Yeah, um, I like that. Yeah. Um, but there's also no way of knowing how they're using, how they'd be using the technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so all of those things keep me up at night. Okay. All right. As you're, as more and more of your containers get out into the wild, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I like I like the thought about conditional surveillance. I also really like the um, I really like that you're worried about that. That's that's good, and it it sort of falls into this is a category we don't get into too often because just because of the the sort of profiles that we talk to, but um, ethical AI, right? And your your training and intelligence. It's you know. Mm -hmm. It's a silicon intelligence, but it's still an intelligence. And um, if you're not careful, your your intelligence isn't going to be ethical or ethically used. It's Absolutely. Important. And I guess in part, it's also about um, yeah, being careful who you partner with, being yeah. careful who you take money from, um, being careful who you onboard on your senior leadership team. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. People that steer the ship. Yep. Um, all right. So that's great advice for. Uh, the startup founders and the the AI experts out there, the people you know at the forefront. To wrap this up, my favorite question of all, the meta question: What did I not ask you that I should have? Oh, um, hmm. Give me a minute to think about that. Yeah, take a minute. How about why I'm excited about our partnership with Indico? Oh, okay. Yeah, why are you, Patricia, excited about this nascent partnership between our two companies? Uh, so I'm very excited about it because uh, I love the way that Indico works uh, mm -hmm. with regards to processing unstructured data, making it super convenient, bringing in a bunch of different uh, services together. Yep. Uh, and also making sure, th sure those services work well. Uh, because curation is really hard for uh, the, the organizations that are trying to determine what to build. Uh, yeah. So I'm really excited to be that we're part of that pipeline now. Uh, and yeah. uh, it's um, it's really great to be uh, part of an ecosystem of high quality. Yeah, but I, well, let me say this first. I also am really excited. Uh, I was uh, I was one of a couple people that got to kick the tires back in you know a few months ago and was really in love with the way the tech worked. So yeah, this is going to be great. And two, I think the point you made earlier that just in the last five or six years, the tech has started to become good enough and is now good enough that you can deploy in the enterprise AI on unstructured data and find real ROI. This is this is the point where you start to build an ecosystem of like I have this tool for this. And I have this tool for this, and here's the platform that glues them all together. And um, you know, I don't do this all the time, but commercial for Indico, Indico's that platform that glues them all together. So uh, you know, come talk to me. It's amazing. Great. Well, this has been Unstructured Unlocked. My guest today has been Patricia Thane, CEO of Private AI, a fantastic privacy company. Patricia, thank you so much. It's been a great time. Thank you so much, Chris. Had a really fun time yeah. as well. Good.